So there's this fun addicting card game called Queen's Blood and this chapter offered an optional tournament but as I was going around the ship making my rounds to talk to every NPC well to see their dialogue but on this last Yu-Gi-Oh duel here I couldn't find Red so where the heck is my moral support dog? This game did not just do like a Scooby-Doo entrance right now. A game called Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. A game that grinded a ton of side stuff but at the same time wasn't as burnt out by it all. I clocked in around 71 hours at the end of a game experiencing most of what the game had to offer aside from hard mode mini games because I'm not sadistic. Okay, maybe a teeny bit. I'm still not entirely sure how I felt about part 1 with the 2020 remake but I can say that this follow up game has been much more enjoyable than that game. And now with another Final Fantasy game out of my backlog, I still have more to do. But first, this perspective video. Minor spoilers before I begin, anything shown about characters has been seen in the trailers, so without further ado. Doing some side content you don't feel like may sound mandatory to make combat more engaging or easier with certain things such as materia, item transmuter for enhanced gear, and getting better scores on many games for weapons. Some objectives may even overlap with each other such as the windmill side quest with intel mini boss battle so chances are you can get irritated having to do something or even beat all the fight activities for the mini boss. I think if you just did the bare minimum in the game, it would be pretty annoying having to not experience combat to the full extent. The story and story elements. Sadly, I wish I could have listed this in the pros section, but in the end, it ended up divisive and tedious at times to me, aside from many games with the option to do the bare minimum on them. NPCs that had minor roles in the original version have a slightly better importance to the story. The amount of cutscenes with the black robes became really obnoxious over time that already having to deal with the whispers was just adding too much to it. Then there's also more bloated stuff like the new soldier boy who has an obsession with Cloud just like Cloud with Sephiroth. But at times it's better such as Cloud being slowly brainwashed is creepy. There are also several moments where Cloud loses himself but the rest of the party acts like nothing major really happened and that just becomes disappointing in the story. It's sadly hard to discuss the story in bigger details since I want to keep it spoiler free but most of the changes happen in the last few chapters. The ending twist of Remake just gets much funkier with the whole timeline idea as it kicks up that sci-fi factor. I think teammates can be stupid sometimes. Versus the first boss with the group, most just stood on ground before actually running up to the enemy and wailing on it. They defend well and all, but sometimes they telegraph super early that can trick you into thinking what the enemy is about to do, so sometimes they're just sitting ducks for more than several seconds. I like how the game eases you into combat. It's friendly enough that even people who technically can skip remake, though not sure since it's a very small minority. The combat goes through the same steps as remake at the start, but different enough so it isn't numbingly boring and repetitive. The game dumps you off at level 40 for the prologue and you rely on a mixture of dodging, healing, and parrying already to make it feel like a direct sequel. Well, before you get dropped back to the present time with your actual crew. Sorry Sephiroth. The main way the combat has changed from Remake to Rebirth are the additions of Synergy skills, Abilities, and Folios. Synergy skills and Abilities are pretty much tag team duo attacks. While named the way they are, technically they should be named Synergy actions and limit breaks. And Synergy abilities can do major stuff like changing up with a jump card, such as Action Bar being 3 maximum for 2 characters for temporary. Folios is a change to weapon upgrades that function as a better skill tree. While confusing at first, I got adjusted quickly over time such as Cloud's elemental abilities from the tree can chain enemies. This is really a game changer alone because casting spells with a small MP pool and less guild to spend on ethers and on top of that being interrupted was rough in Remake. And here those are all less of a problem. Assessing is in a way mandatory but now feels much more rewarding. With folios there are much more elemental abilities for combinations, not to mention a larger roster of party members from the get go so both pressuring and staggering feels better. Sometimes it may be easier too. 
My gripe with the first game was that while you can assess, foils were absent and fewer material slots bugged me when I didn't have the right elemental material on for a mini boss or boss. There is also a better emphasis on defending and blocking such as Cloud, Bear, and Red. There are also more counter attacks to reward defensive plays. Characters aside from the trio party are also backup members, well technically they just run around the field in the background, they don't replace anyone down. While I'm not sure how much benefit they give in battle, it's still a nice touch. There is also somewhat air combat, Cloud, Tifa, and Yuffie can go into the air usually, but it's really just Tifa. Hopefully they improve it in the next game. But definitely, I like the addition of the new characters, Red, Yuffie, Kate Sif, they all get to play very differently. Well, Yuffie's my favorite since I just ninjutsu all the time. Ninjutsu. Dungeons definitely are better with more exploration. More on that in the next section. New gameplay elements. Aside from side quests, we now have different stuff. Much more compared to a few mini games and remakes, such as hitting boxes, though that also makes a return. Some definitely will bother others, but the more options, the better to me, honestly. I mean, no one complained about that for open worlds, which Rebirth is as close as the Xenoblade trilogy to it. The way the world design works is through areas, which offer many activities. Activation intel, essentially towers that have trash mobs defending it before you can map out regions. Towers are not required to unlock everything, but help pinpoint locations of places. Chocobos are also necessary and used for excavation intel, sneaking to catch the local chocobo, Sensing out things such as treasure loot and exploration in general made chocobos feel integrated into the gameplay aside from just being a mount. There are also these chocobo rest stops that you can fast travel to but they're kinda useless. So if you do more you can just customize your mount. Expedition intel and divine intel are spots that use simple QTE segments in caves or small hideouts. Moogle Emporiums house Moogles where you chase them into their own pig pen and upon completion can exchange rewards such as manuscripts for skill points. Fiend Intel have combat battles that have three objectives, though honestly I don't know what the first two actually achieve besides flux purpose. Doing all of these battles may unlock a harder one such as the Mindfire mini boss that wrecked me early. Shadowy's combat simulator makes a return and often updates over time with the story and after completing fiend intels. Divine intels can also weaken summons in the combat simulator to be much easier. Doing more intel also grants you points to spend on materia. There's an item transmuter that crafts or upgrades stuff for consumables, accessories, and key materials. This incentivizes exploration and going around nooks and crannies to loot things. Dungeons also have emphasized this, such as bear shooting crystals and Yuffie throwing into her shuriken in dungeons. Proto relic phenomenons are a chain of side quests like the return of the clumsy thieves with an overall storyline. Most are in the form of mini games, so on that note, many, many, many games. The Golden Saucer and Costa del Sol areas also provide a ton of activities. Queen's Blood deserves to be made into an actual card game, though Square Enix has a greedy stance on digital stuff, so I have pretty low hopes for that. Lastly in this section, I would like to point out that they added some degree of motion controls. Not super crazy, but for a JRPG, this is a step up in innovation. The characters. Like the original Final Fantasy VII, the character development is pretty well rounded here. The beginning of Sephiroth's descent into madness was pretty good in the original, but with dialogue here, it was much better. It gave off a nice sinister vibe. There are also some other messed up bits such as the constantly crazy things Hojo keeps doing. Hojo's experiments in the original version and Crisis Core was already cruel, but it's pretty messed up here. And then there's other bits like this one dude just got swooped up by a bird for food. The characters have some differences, given my tidbit about the story elements, they're my second favorite cast of Final Fantasy characters. Final Fantasy IX is my favorite by the way. Yuffie as usual is always cheerful, but I love how they added singing as dialogue. There's a return of branching choices, but they are much fewer in the game outside of Cloud speaking one-on-one -on -one with characters. 
the addition of relationship choices is cool since there is something later on that reflects this. So something for Persona fans, I guess. Outside of the party characters, cutscenes with NPCs feel more lifelike than most JRPGs with just simple arm and mouth movements. The animations are definitely something that makes it much nicer. World building and more. I always like to go around and talk to every NPC possible, which Rebirth, like Remake and Final Fantasy 16 plays out when you walk or run close by to them. Aside from the main cast dialogue, I think this is really neat and I don't have to prompt every NPC like most games do. Exploring certain activities also give different stories of their own such as Queen's Blood, Proto Relic quests as I mentioned, and obviously side quests. Side quests have very few branching choices now but give optional choices, usually in the form of questions like more context to learn about characters. Also side quests usually involve another party member to bond with. That typically has some relation to the NPC in question. Excavation Intel also grants many summaries of regions for a quick read. Personally, I think the graphics and lighting are fine in this game. Well, sometimes lighting feels like a flashbang on some angles. While some areas are sparse or lacking in detail, I think the overall beauty of the game still outshines all that. Even the starting town in the present day was crazy detailed and feels like out of a Disney amusement park. Even the more they create Kingdom Hearts, and well those games know how to capture the Disney essence in the worlds. And again, often the enemies love trying to start a brawl in the towns too. The environments are beautiful in this game and tons of places to explore. Though sometimes most can be, well, a giant field and force, at least for the first region. Doing all the side content can really supply you with going around most of the area. For example, an abandoned shipyard was pretty much made for a single cache location. Another nice touch is that each region has its own distinct variants of chocobos, deposits, and other things. As for cutscenes, there are many cinematic cutscenes spread out than just the common in-game cutscenes. It feels like Advent Children on steroids. Don't get me started on the music too. I think Nobuyo Eiyumatsu is indisputably one of the best video game composers. However, while he did work on some new tracks for Rebirth, it's also good to remember that others have worked on it, including more such as the composer for Octopath Traveler. I can definitely say that this game went above and beyond the original soundtracks from playing the piano to mini games to others. Here's some samples. Yes, the game was crazy enough to give some side quests and many games their own tracks, especially the dog theme. I would have lost interest in the optional content if the music wasn't varied. Among all the JRPGs, Final Fantasy probably will never disappoint with its field themes. I don't think I ever got sick of any of it, though aside from Chocobo music playing randomly, which I can't figure out the conditions on why it does that sometimes. There are also different battle themes in the combat simulator so you won't hear it so repetitively. And the several motifs and versions of the main theme and Aerith's theme was just something special in Rebirth. <laughs> Traversal is much better than it was in Remake, with verticality, being able to swim, and jumping on top of pretty much any object, granted if it's big enough. Gil is less of a nuisance because of collecting many materials and in general rack up a good amount doing stuff and running into monsters from time to time, and chances are if you're doing a lot of side activity, they'll just respawn. I don't like the gameplay segments of pushing or pulling stuff or being prompted to press or hold buttons that really should play out more as cutscenes or at least faster or fewer interactions. If I really wanted that, I'd play games like The Last of Us and Spider-Man. They aren't super long, but when you're just glued to a cutscene and well, there you go, press stuff to activate, it would make sense if it was a high intense action sequence such as having to speed through an area or rescuing people. 
I wish the overall gameplay system was tweaked better. Menu is cleaner than before, but there are some caveats to it. Item transmuter on top is awkward for a first spot, and also while the party is much nicer looking, that categorizes most of every character's kit. Not sure why combat settings have to be accessed for editing party instead. I constantly kept going to the weapon upgrade tab but it's nothing aside from checking stat and ability differences whereas you would need to go to a foil machine for that. This makes chocobo rest stops kind of pointless if you need a foil machine so it's better to just fast travel to region and hop back. Chadwick talks too much via discord. How many times do I have to pull out the gizmo to speak to him after almost every other side activity? Max capacity for an item is 99. Yep. That's just it for this nitpick. I just like to hoard stuff as if it's Breath of the Wild. If you like to sweep every area for materials, it stockpiles fast and has to be sold for extra gill. The game's default settings were weird. They didn't really ask much at the start aside from language. Typically, a game lets you customize better. So I didn't discover it until 3 hours into it. One was the graphics mode, which automatically defaulted to graphics setting. May not bother you, but each to their own. The other was the awful map. Maybe it's because I'm used to many maps and games, but I think it's much better than the Punky Vine system, especially with how rocky and vertical the terrain can be. It's like having PTSD from Xenoblade Chronicles 2's quest and navigation if I had kept at it. And third is terrain action, which pretty much shows a white outline to tell if you can interact with something outside of running. Now, I'm not the biggest Namor fan out there. If anything, I kinda set my expectations a bit lower than usual for most JRPGs since some of the stuff in Kingdom Hearts 3 and Final Fantasy 7 Remake were a bit weird. I was a little hesitant to see how well I would perceive this game due to knowing that it's not going to end here with a finale when there's a, another game being in the works. So I played Xenoblade Chronicles X, Zelda Breath of the Wild, Ghost of Tsushima, and Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. This game is like a good mix of them. Booting things, mixing or combining ingredients to make gear, mapping objectives through the Remna wave towers, and different objectives for side activities are all reminiscent of those games. You would jig a baby chocobo or hawk to guide you like Toshima's fox. It does get a little tedious at times in the process, but can't really complain about side content in games aside from rewards that would greatly benefit for combat. I think there's something for everyone here for the gameplay, aside from needing to play the 2020 remake. As for the story elements, definitely could have been toned down. As cool as a full bone remake Choji is to the original, the story didn't need to be that much lengthier with a bunch of cutscenes and additions. It would just deter people away, <coughs> just like Persona 5's game length. Oh, in conclusion, this is a very solid JRPG. I know that the game is very divisive and nitpicky on a lot of elements. The story still is weird following what the 2020 remake had done and honestly the changes and twists actually made me appreciate the original story more but I think it's still very enjoyable. From animations to voice acting to new segments that makes it much longer than the original story of course but fun touches are amazing. I would say keep mild expectations on the story, but the gameplay, exploration, and music was as great as I had hoped it to be when I watched the trailers again and again. Combat wise, it's much more enjoyable and I felt the desire to actually swap characters with more experimenting. And the party often gets split up so it's a nice way to see from other characters perspectives as you take control of them. Okay. Exploration was better for the majority of it and still was surprising me even up until the last region. I liked exploration with the traversal and more freedom to go around places such as dungeons having more design space like this park. What I really liked the most is that you can sneak and avoid most mobs. While you can flee, I felt the linear path of going place to place in Remake was worse that you just had to kill every mob for EXP gain. Here in Rebirth, all the optional stuff makes it less of a slog and can breeze through. While the game can be more on the easy side with additions and a larger party roster, I still got whooped by some fights too, so yeah. 
I came across a few of these where I had to change up my strategy or level up a bit for more skill points. The game really fixed most of my gripes about the first remake and I can say I was pleased by it. So I give Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth a solid 9.5 sacks out of 10 sacks and currently in my game of the year. Well now that Metaphor Re Fantasio has a release date, uh, that might be my game of the year maybe. However, after my last two perspectives slash review videos, I would like to say again a numbers biased. When I tend to reflect on a video game past beating it, such as a week, a month, three months, or beating another game in the same genre, I might end up moving my score around. In this case, it's been a week since I finished the game, so take the score with a grain of salt that may change slightly, probably to 9 and a quarter out of 10. Yes, I have a weird scoring system of quarters. I think it'll still be in my top 10 JRPGs for a long while and definitely at least a score of 9. I've also provided something I've been doing with previous JRPGs for a system, so I hope this is useful. That's it for this perspective. Leave a comment if you liked this video or hated it because, well, Final Fantasy VII has a weird fan base. I try to upload a video every month, so if you want to see an upcoming video on one of these potential candidates soon, no guarantees though, since the backlog is inevitable, then subscribe to my channel. Until next time, Zenato out.